Welcome to AIN Debrief, where we take a deeper look at the most important or interesting aviation story of the past week with the AIN editor who covered it. I'm AIN News Editor Chad Trotvetter. This week, AIN Senior Editor and Future Flight Editor Charles Alcock gives his take on the 9-seat all-electric E-Flyer 800 announced by Bi Aerospace as a more economical and environmentally friendly alternative to the venerable Beechcraft King Air. He also discusses Bi's probability of certifying the E-Flyer 800 by its 2026 target, as well as the higher density lithium sulfur batteries from Oxus that are slated to be employed as a sole power source on a cabin class twin prop airplane. So I'm here with Charles Alcock. Uh, he's our editor of Future Flight um, publication, well, also a database as well. Um, and uh, on Earth Day last week, um, by Aerospace, a uh, Denver company that's developing a two and four seat electric aircraft announced it was going upstream and is now doing the E-Flyer 800, uh, which is a, a cabin class twin um, kind of a competitor to a uh, King Air uh, C-90 or maybe even a King Air 260. So, Charlie, can you just uh, tell us, you know, what what's the aircraft, uh, how many how many passengers, how much is going to cost, how far does it fly, and what technology are they using in this all-electric aircraft? Yes, yeah, certainly, Chad. This is a very interesting development, and it, it kind of marks the first time that a company from the you know the, the world of electric aviation, which is still seen by many as somewhat niche, is directly challenging aircraft in the traditional business aviation sector. The E-Fly 800 is being designed to carry seven passengers and uh, one or two pilots, so potentially eight passengers and one pilot. Um, Crucially, it will be able to fly on its electric motors um, up to around 575 miles. Now, keep in mind, that's just barely a one-third of some of the aircraft that it's competing with, like the King Airs. It's, it's significantly less range, so there is a compromise there. But obviously, electric engines um, bring benefits too in terms of operating costs and indeed environmental sustainability. Um, and the big breakthrough is that Bai is going to be using some new electric motors uh, provided by the French company Safran, and also very significantly using new batteries, new lithium sulfur batteries that are being developed by a company called Oxys Energy. So this this really is quite a significant step for them, and you know it potentially breaks us out of the thinking that. Electric aircraft are fine, but only those little tiny ones that carry a couple of people and, and don't do much more than that. So what, what's the cost and what about the technology, especially the batteries? Are they safe? Well, first of all, on the cost, all we know is that by Aerospace, which is a company based in Denver, has, has not disputed the estimate that the E-Fly 800 will cost roughly the same as, say, a King Air 260 which would put it just a bit over the $6 million mark. So it's not actually going to be cheaper to buy than some of its rivals, but they say that the operating costs could be as little as just one-fifth of these aircraft. Uh, Of course, they're basing that largely on the assumption that electricity will continue to cost less than than jet A fuel, and that's not completely a given. But they're also saying that the electric motors will be less expensive to maintain than turboprop engines. Uh, Now, you asked me about the batteries. That's a crucial point. So the first thing to know about these lithium sulfur batteries is that they have much better energy density levels than the lithium ion batteries, which are very common in this sector so far. Um, And this is really a sort of holy grail. You know, to give you some idea, existing lithium ion batteries uh, come in at around the sort of 220 to 250 watt hour per kilogram mark. And Oxys is saying that these lithium sulfur ones will already be about 450 watt hours per kilogram. But in just a few years from now, that could increase up to, uh, you know, 550 and even 600. So that that really would be a a big step forward. But I'm not dodging the safety issue because that is significant. You know, there have been incidents in the past where lithium ion batteries have caught fire and, and, you know, they're somewhat seen as, as quite a threat hazard. 
And Oxus says that it's addressed this. It says that the chemistry of its batteries is different and that although it still has lithium in it, which is a metal that is considered somewhat risky from a, from a fire point of view, um, it, it has what it calls lithium sulfur electrolytes, which produce kind of a, a film that covers the, the metallic lithium part. Um, and that means that it has a higher melting point. In other words, it will have to get a lot hof, hotter <laughs> before it potentially catches fire. So, yes, to your point, they, there seems to be a valid claim that it will be safer. But let's just be clear. We can't take that as a given until the uh, safety authorities have actually confirmed that. So is this certifiable in, in you know, they're doing the E-Flyer 2 and E-Flyer 4, which are, uh, you know, they're small, smaller airplanes. They're, we're talking maybe a, you know, a small trainer or, a, you know, the, the E-Flyer 4 is a four-seater. So um, this is kind of a, a much bigger platform. They're looking at certification by 2026. Is that doable? I, I, well, first of all, I think it's definitely certifiable because because here's the thing. Fundamentally, what they're doing with these aircraft is is not radically different from what they're doing with the smaller E Flyer Two and E Flyer Four. Now, if you look at those aircraft, they yes, they do look significantly different from the E Flyer Eight Hundred, but just in terms of scale, size, but the configuration of these Saffron motors. Um, and, and the batteries is fundamentally the same, although I don't actually think they're yet using the Oxys batteries on the smaller aircraft. But the, the architecture of the plane is fundamentally the same, and the assumptions that they're making about the propulsion performance are you know, fundamentally the same. By Aerospace is, is being cautiously optimistic. It appears to be making good progress with the certification of the smaller aircraft. Um, I'm led to believe that that might even come, if not before the end of this year, then potentially early in 2022. They're already scaling up their production facilities, so they fully expect to get those aircraft certified and start producing them. They're saying that they might well need up to another six years to do the E-Flyer 800. I, I really do think that that is perfectly doable. Um, you know, They've allowed themselves a, a generous time frame there to work on that, and they're being less sort of bullish in terms of how long it will take than some of the EVATOL aircraft developers who are, who are making all sorts of promises that it would keep me awake at night. And, and they're saying they have some orders for this, and they announced uh, earlier this week uh, an order from L3 Harris uh, for a um, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance uh, version of the, uh, the Flyer 800. Yes, that's exactly right. They they are already, first of all, they're claiming that they've got significant numbers of orders um, for the E-Fly 800 from, from uh, companies who might include air taxi operators, charter firms, cargo operators. They, they haven't yet specified you know, exactly who those companies are, but I'm told that within uh, a week or so, there might be some more announcements on that. But yeah, this, this commitment from L3 Harris Technologies is really significant. Because what L3 Harris is proposing to do is convert the E-Flyer 800 into a platform for military use for missions such as intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. And again, this puts it directly in, in, the, uh, in the same sandpit as aircraft like the King Air and potentially some, some business jets which have been converted for military service. So it's further evidence that you know electric aviation pioneers like BYC quite a broad scope of applications. But there's one big but here. Remember how we were talking about the, the limited range of the, of the passenger carrying aircraft? Well, the big thing in ISR missions is endurance. How long can you stay up in the sky, flying circles uh, over the bad guys, watching what they're doing or, or you know, monitoring something that needs monitoring? And time is everything there. Now, uh, we don't yet have word back on on just how long the endurance for those flights will be. Uh, I am hoping to get that soon. But a key part of that is that, okay, they're not going to have passengers in their aircraft, but they're going to have a bunch of presumably quite heavy equipment, you know, radars and, and other electronic warfare technology. And until we know what that stuff weighs, we're not really going to know, you know, how long that aircraft is going to be able to apply uh, to fly on just one single charge. And that's going to be very significant. By the way, talking about recharging time, Bai says that it's aiming for the aircraft to be fully recharged after about 20 or 30 minutes on the ground. 
Yeah, actually getting back to the ISR platform, not only is there a weight, but also the power drain from, from radar and other surveillance equipment. So that's a big consideration as well. Yes, good point. I, I, yeah, I hadn't even thought about that, but that, that's also another question that they, they need to resolve because, yeah, all that stuff's going to be sitting in there doing its thing, burning juice, and, and that is a factor. I mean, I struggle to believe that, that a really experienced military contractor like L3 Harris hasn't thought of this and, and you know, they've made some sort of plan for it. Of course, not all surveillance missions are the same. You know, some of them involve loitering for a long period of time. Others might include, you know, a relatively short mission. Let's let's get over there, see what's happening, and come back again straight away. So, you know, arguably that isn't necessarily something that would that would restrict them too seriously. Yeah, and um, getting back to buy, uh, they are the leaders in this segment. Um, I know Pipistrol has done; they actually certified a, a two seater, but uh, buy is kind of taking the lead here with a bigger aircraft. Is that right? Yes, they 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 were. PIP to the post in terms of first to certify a light aircraft uh, powered by electricity because Pipistrel achieved that last year with with uh, an aircraft certified by AESA. But yes, for a larger aircraft, um, this would be a first. Now, as it happens, Pipistrel claims that it's got some plans for some larger aircraft too, but it hasn't said as much as, as BI has about what its intentions are. Um, I should also say that um, there are a couple of companies out there who are looking not to build totally new aircraft powered by electricity, but to convert uh, existing aircraft. So we've got Magni X, which is trying to convert um, Cessna Grand Caravans and, and Havilland Beavers. And then there's a company called Ampere, which also has pretty similar plans. And you know, in those cases, the path certification potentially is somewhat easier because you don't have to certify certify the whole airplane. You just have to get a supplemental type certificate to put electric motors into it. Uh, you know, still no easy feat. So there, there's plenty of competition out there, which is which is very encouraging. But yeah, hats off to buy. This was a pretty big announcement this week. Yeah, in Textron is also they step they just uh, set up a new e aviation division, um, yes. and we don't know whether they're going to do clean sheet airplanes or whether they're going to take uh, Textron aviation products and try to electrify them. Right, we don't know what's going on. Yeah, th th this is fascinating. You know, so Textron had been really quite uh, silent about its intentions, and and we somehow managed to release the cat from the bag and and uh, report that they're forming this new division. But even now. They're politely declining, you know, requests for interviews. They're not really apparently wanting to say too much about it. But it's been interesting because for more than a year, you know, I mentioned Ampere and Magnix. They've been basically trying to to uh, to convert uh, Textron aircraft, existing Textron aircraft, and that left me wondering, hey, Textron, wake up here! You know, somebody else thinks that your aircraft have uh, an electric future. Why don't you do that? Um, and now we've got Bi Aerospace directly challenging Textron's King Air aircraft. And it will be fascinating to see what Textron comes back with uh, in, in terms of, of electric um, aviation plans. Yeah, but for now, it looks like Bi has the lead. So it'll be interesting to see how they develop this program. It certainly will. And we're going to be all over it. All right. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks for listening to AI and Debrief. Another podcast episode will air next Friday. In the meantime, go to www.ainonline.com for the latest aviation news from AIN.